My name is Eric Wilson. I'm the assistant to the dean here at the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. Welcome to today's Brown Bag Lunch. I guess our public programs department thought it would be appropriate to have the youngest person on staff here. <laughs> the youngest person we have, the youngest guest speaker we have scheduled for the, for the spring series, and probably the youngest speaker we've had to date here at the Clinton School. We're excited about it. But despite his age, Patrick Cook Deegan brings quite a bit of experience to the table. Here at the Clinton School, we try to enhance the capacity of our students to work across disciplinary, <coughs> ethnic, racial, and geographic boundaries. We offer classes in conflict transformation, social change, and leadership. But Patrick didn't need a class to cross, to, uh, to cross boundaries. He used a bike. During the summer of 2006, he traveled by himself over 2,800 miles across Laos, <coughs> Cambodia, and Burma, working in conjunction with a nonprofit organization called Room to Read. Patrick's original goal was to raise $15,500 to build one primary school in Laos. However, the trip exceeded his expectations. Patrick ended up raising over $22,500, enough to build a primary school and library in Laos, <laughs> as well as two K-12 scholarships for girls in Cambodia. During his trip, Patrick was tailed by a government official in Burma, which I want to hear about. He was the guest of honor at a Buddhist seminary in the village in Laos. He even did a 10-day silent meditation retreat in Cambodia. As you can tell, there's a lot to learn from Patrick, despite his age. And before he returns to Brown University for his senior year, we are excited to have him here at the Clinton School. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Cook -Dee. For, for having me, Dean, uh, for uh, being the youngest person here. I was, I emailed uh, Patricia Donahue, who's right here, she's a Brown alumni, and I was figuring out how to set up all these speaking things around the country, and it was kind of like my bicycle trip, so I really had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> how do you go about getting speaking gigs and stuff like that? So I emailed all the Brown alumni and said, hey, can you help me out? And she said, yeah, here's some schools, try the Clinton School of Public Service. And I was like, that sounds like a big name. So I emailed them, figuring it would never work. And then Team Rutherford comes back like, a day later and says, hey, sure, we'd love to have you. And then my dad's a professor at Duke. And so I went to him and I was like, oh, dad, I'm just being the Clinton School of Public Service. And he's always on typing on the computer and he ignores me most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, you're doing what? And it, like, he had like that five minute pause where it like registered and looked. But I think that uh, it's important for young people to talk to, the, to an older generation and to the same generation because you know most of the people I see speak at Brown uh, tend to be older. And I think a lot of the people that I've talked with that are older I think it's inspiring and helpful to know that there is a generation of kids our age that want to do something about the world. So, you know, I think it's a lot of foresight to invite someone young because it shows that there is a group of people out there changing stuff. And that's what the Clinton School tries to bring in kids like that. And before I tell you about the bike trip itself, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what inspired me to do it. And then tell you about the actual biking and a few stories, and then what's come out of the trip. And I had the privilege of seeing President Clinton speak at Brown two years ago, and he there's a lot of things he said that I remember, and his message was the same as uh, your introduction about you know the idea of living in global citizenship, having shared values. The thing he said about public speaking that I remember is that you're supposed to give people three messages and emphasize that throughout your speech. So the one thing I'm going to emphasize is that travel can be really eye-opening and is a form of education that's not, you know, sit down in the classroom, but can often be a lot more powerful and it can be in addition to what you learn in the classroom. The second thing is that adventure and travel is not necessarily self-indulgent, but can, can be bind, combined in a way to do good. In this case, you know, doing a bike ride to raise money for schools. And the third thing is that to build a more global citizenship in a more interconnected world, you need people that start thinking at a global level. And the way to do that, a really good way to do that, is by getting people to go out and experience the world. Because 
it's it's not that you can't be a global citizen without traveling, but it's a lot easier to become a global citizen if you have traveled. So I think this is some of the stuff that I've learned over the past two years. In the past two years, I've been to about 15 different countries, and since I went to Brown, I barely see my parents, and I've been home for about a month. So I've had the opportunity to, you know, travel a lot. And one of the trips I took started in June 2005, and it was a, I think a nine-month trip, and it was a backpacking trip, and it was the first time that I traveled on my own throughout Europe. It was the first time I traveled on my own outside of Europe. And I spent about two months hitchhiking through Australia and New Zealand, and basically uh, hiking a lot, doing some paragliding, like just fun stuff. And then I went up to Southeast Asia where I spent six weeks. And after that, I went to the Middle East and I met some friends in Jordan and stayed there. And then I went to a semester abroad at Istanbul, Turkey, where I studied Middle Eastern history and I lived with eight pretty devout Muslim guys, which is a really interesting experience. And then I convinced my parents to go to Slovakia for Christmas, and then we flew home. And on the trip, my time in Laos is by far the most influential to me. It made the biggest uh, difference in how I saw things. Because I'd never been to a developing country. And have you guys been to Laos or Thailand? Anyone here? Well, they're both developing countries, but there's a huge gap between them. So I spent the first amount of my time in Thailand, which is, I mean, you can't say something's a second world country, but it has first world infrastructure in a lot of cases. So I thought, oh, this is a developing country. Like, you know, I'd write a lot of stuff, but I didn't really understand what everyone was talking about. And then I crossed the border to Laos, and you know what they're talking about. Because I went during rainy season, and there's no roads. You know, I took a boat, actually, up this river, because you couldn't get to get to it by road. So I saw a lot of the things that I'd always read about, but you can't really understand until I got there. And I, I met a lot of people in small villages. And I, I have like a tendency to go out of my way to do something weird and different. So I try and get rid of all the other Western backpackers and go off on my own, which is really good because then I, I went to a lot of places like this where uh, their first reaction you can't see, but they're like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, I'm glad you're here. And so, like, I stayed with a lot of families like this in small places, and this is a small house. How many of you guys have been to a developing country? Okay, so, a third. And you'll have 10 or 12 people living in the size of your bedroom at home. It's very, very, very typical. And it's the first time I'd seen it, and this family was awesome, and... You know, I learned a lot from them, you know, about the importance of family, and he actually spoke <coughs> some English. So we just talked about the differences in lifestyle, but you can also see that, you know, this kid has one pair of clothes, and, you know, if this girl gets sick, there's only one hospital in the whole country of Laos for six million people. So you realize that, you know, there's a lot of things I take for granted. And every time I went to a village, it was like I was a king or something, and all the kids would crowd around, and they think it was amazing. I had a digital camera because they'd never seen a picture of themselves before. And in one case, I, I hung out with this kid for a while one day in a small village, and he didn't really speak English, but I had a phrase book, a lonely planet phrase book, which is like a lifesaver. So you point, and then he points. <laughs> and so. He pointed eventually, and he said, he pointed the word school, and we went and visited the school, which looks like that. And that's the primary school in their village for 198 kids. And this is a picture inside the school. So, the picture kind of speaks for itself. And this is, this is during rainy season, which happens every year which means you can't use that for five or six months because this gets flooded because it's on the ground. Obviously it's all muddy. It's just one chalk, it's the only chalkboard they have and they've used it so much you can't even erase it. And I, mean, I don't know how you go to school here. A lot of times they'll sit on the ground or they'll have class outside because they can't even go into the school. So it was something that seeing personally had a really, really big effect on me. And it was something that, you know, made me realize when I go to school and complain about stuff. 
you know, it's different than them. And, and it wasn't just schools, it was, you know, there's no health clinic for them in a day's drive. And there's no dentist, so all the girls are eight years old and the teeth are already rotting out. And so I, throughout my trip, I kept thinking about this after I left my house. So I went to Jordan and then I went to Turkey. And I realized that by the end of my time in Istanbul, about three months later, that this was really like kind of something new to me, but also that I was passionate about. And one thing I was really passionate about was travel. And the other thing was doing something so the kids didn't have to go to a school like this. So at the time, I was leaving Turkey. And I didn't, I mean, I went to school in Turkey, but it wasn't that hard. So I always had like little side projects going on. And I read this book by Sir Edmund Hillary. He is the first person that summited Everest. And he's actually, I mean, he's probably the most famous Kiwi ever. And when I read his book, I mean, he was back in the day, he was like a king. Everyone knew him. And when he summited, they called the queen in England and everyone had a festival. And he's actually on the money. He's on the money museum. Like, he's a legend. He's a living legend. When you read his biography, what I found most fascinating is that the most important thing to him that he's ever done was after he did all this stuff in the Paul climbing mountains, he went back and built schools and waterways and created a, a foundation that's now built dozens of schools and created an airport and all these things. And it, it seemed to me that he was exactly what I was looking for in terms of someone that was effectively creating or combining adventure with altruism and combining the two and using them to reinforce each other. So now a lot of people that go and climb in Nepal raise money for his foundation and help to build schools. So reading this book was just like, all this stuff, like lightning bolt go off in my head. And I started getting different ideas. And some of them were ridiculous, like, like paragliding off a mountain through Laos to <laughs> build money for a school. And I thought of all this different stuff. And I ended up uh, realizing that I wanted to go on like a bike ride. And I had no idea how I decided on the bike ride. Like I'm, I know I'm supposed to tell a story about how I found out that biking I was really passionate about. And I didn't even own a bike since I was 14. So I just decided it would be a pretty cool way to see a country and a pretty cool way to you know, get a better feel for a country. And also, be, I mean, the bike ride was a lot more adventurous than I actually anticipated. <laughs> so I figured out that I wanted to go on a bike ride, and I figured out that I wanted to do something in the house, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a health clinic or there's a lot of different things you can do, like water irrigation. And I thought about it a lot, and I ended up on a school because I'm really involved with education in the U.S. and charter schools, and so I thought I would just take my interest in the U.S. and education and kind of make it global. And the reason that I find education so empowering is because it creates a generation. You, know, you can have a generation of hope if you have all these villages where most of the people are illiterate, all the elders. And if you go and you have a school like that, then their grandkids are going to be illiterate. But if you create you know, a good school where they can actually you know, learn to read and get some basics, then it's a sign of hope that the next generation might be able to read and that you're not necessarily stuck farming for 12 hours a day in a rice field and if your kid gets sick, they die of a fever. So I thought that it was, it was a sign of progress. And the other thing that really attracted it to me is that in a very kind of American way, it's you lift yourself up by your bootstraps. Because if you can learn how to read, no one can ever take that away from you. And it's not something that needs to be reinforced and reinforced. Like if you build a health clinic, for instance, you have to go build a health clinic and I would have to find a way to provide all the materials each year to the health clinic and provide a doctor, and it's a lot more difficult. But if you build a school and they have teachers there and they learn how to read, they can kind of help themselves. And it's something that is a less integral process. So I decided on a bike ride through Laos, and I decided that I needed to build a school. So now I needed to figure out how to get money and how I was going to build the school, because I decided like me going over there with the backpack of bricks probably wouldn't work. <laughs> and I was going to Slovakia where I convinced my mom to go for Christmas. And my mom always, always brings these crazy articles about random stuff, and most of the time I just throw them out. Like, she'll bring me like, like 
how someone lying like found Zen or something, and I was really she'll bring me the craziest articles. So she came in in the hotel in Slovakia and handed me an article, and I thought it was gonna be some like thing about I God knows what, and she actually like came through really hardcore and was awesome and found this article about this organization called Room to Read, which builds schools and libraries and computer labs in Southeast Asia in seven different countries. And it felt like one of those like moments where like, the sun came down, so it was right when I was looking for an organization to build schools in Laos. And like the third sentence was, we build schools in Laos. So I was like, awesome. All right. So all I had to do was make sure that they were, you know, a legitimate organization and had good backing. And, and I went on their website, and their website's really good. And they've actually won a, a number of awards, um, like the Times 2004 Hero Award and a bunch of other things. And the reason that they've won so many awards is because, for two reasons, one, so it was started by an ex-Microsoft exec, and he kind of uses that uh, business background to create an NGO that's based on results. And the second thing that really appealed to me was that in the same way that education is creates self-sufficient people, they make it so that when they go and build a school, it's not like they just show up and they start building a school for you. They create a contract with the village that says, we're going to help you build a school, but you have to actually build the school yourself. And you have to use, you have to generate half the supplies or half the labor, which in most cases is actually building the school themselves. Or sometimes they'll cut down bamboo. But there's two good things that come out of that. One is that it cuts down the cost. So a World Bank school in Laos costs $90,000. And a Japanese aid one, the equivalent of USA and Japan, costs $40,000. The school of Room Tree cost 15. And the second thing that was really good, it comes out as it creates a sense of ownership. So if you want to build a second house, if you actually go and build it yourself, you'll have, you know, feel a lot more connected to it than if you just show up and throw some money down and it's there. So I really was attracted to Room Tree. And then I came back to the US, so now I had a place, da 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 da, on you money. And so each time I did this, like, I thought it was a really big breakthrough that I got one thing, and then I'd like be really happy for like three or four hours, and then wake up the next morning and figure that I needed another thing. <laughs> so I, I figured out that I actually needed fifteen thousand five hundred dollars to build a school, and I'd never raised money before in my life. So now, you, when you do anything now, you build a website. Like if you're going to the bathroom, you want people to know you. <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing I did was make a website with a friend, and then I started sending off, and this was in January last year, 2006, I started sending off emails and letters to anyone that I've ever met, like everyone in this room, I just like, I'd like email my grandma's friend that I met like 15 years ago and be like, remember me when I didn't have any hair and was this tall, <laughs> like I'd give some money to my bike ride. So eventually I figured, I figured out like an effective way to get money. And by mid-May, I had $15,500. So that was like another big breakthrough, and I was really happy. And I remember going out with my friends for beer, and then they were like, well, you still have to bike the country. I was like, that's a good point. <laughs> so, then I bought a bicycle, which is a good thing to happen. How many people here are cyclists? All right, so how many people here aren't cyclists? Okay, well, cyclists are weird. <laughs> it's like a little cult. And they all have, I thought a bike was like a bike, and you go buy it, you ride it. And you go to a bike store, and they're like, weird, freaky people, and they're like, what size are your wheels, what kind of geeky gadgets are you going to get on that? And I was like, well, I just need like a, a bike to get me through the house. And so all the people at the bike store thought I was crazy, because I didn't have a bike before, and I couldn't like put it back together in my sleep and all this stuff. And so they were kind of right, but I got lucky on my trip, and no big accident happened. Right before I was about to leave, I uh, ran over my bike in my car. <laughs> and so, I was going on a training ride in North Carolina, where I live, and I was, it was a pretty tiring one, so I put my, uh, my bike behind my car, and then went to go stretch, and looked out the rearview mirror and saw the top of the bike, and then didn't see the bottom of the bike, but didn't really register, and then I ran over my bike and heard a lot of noise. 
and went out and saw this. And so this is like four days before I was supposed to leave. And I took it to my friend at REI, who works at the bike store. And I was like, jeez, I was like, I got a middle problem. I was like, can you fix it? And I don't know, like I said, I don't know anything about bikes. So I was like, can you just pull it out or something? He's like, your bike's total. So I was freaking out, like, to say the least. And I was like, ah. And my, my dad's like, calm down, calm down. And James called up the REI headquarters and showed the people on my website and got me a free bike shipped overnight and put the bike together. So all in all, he probably did like a thousand dollars worth of work for me. And when I showed up to pay for it, it said no charge, which, go REI. <laughs> <laughs> so the bike that I actually started riding in Laos, when I opened it, DHL shipped my bike for free, they sponsored me. So when I opened it, it was a bike I'd never ridden before, and I didn't even know what color it was. And it was a nice, a nice blue, which I like. And so this was four days before, and then I got to Laos, and this is a picture of the ride I actually did. And I started up the china Lao border and came down here, and this is about 1,200 miles. And I took a bus, because this road is bad, it's a really big understatement. And then went about, I think this was 600 miles, and took a bus back. And the only way to enter Burma legally is by air. So I put it on the airplane and uh, biked about 1,000 miles up here. So all together, you stretch it out. It's, a, it's almost the exact same distance as LA to New York City, which I had no idea at the time I was going to bike that far. I kind of just got to the Lao border and kept going. I, I didn't really plan that much. And this is a picture of me with my bike. So that's about all the stuff I had. And I had maybe one or two changes of clothes and a lot of bike gadgets I didn't know how to work. <laughs> if something went wrong, hopefully someone would know how they work. So I usually smelled pretty bad and wore the, probably had these clothes on for about two weeks in the same row at this point. But like, I didn't really care because I was always by myself. And I didn't have a good girlfriend with me or anything. <laughs> so, this, I'm just going to give you an idea of what, what a day was like for me. And this, this day was the third day. And I was coming, actually I started at Long Prabang and went up to the Chinese border and took a bus back. So this day was about around 100 miles. And I slept at a guest house like this. And the guest house are pretty much a mat on the ground. And you pay $2 and you go to sleep and you're... Uh, shower is a big bucket you don't bother on yourself and you totally get used to it and it's fine you don't have when I got, got to Nam Penh after like six weeks I took a hot shower and I stayed in it for like 45 minutes <laughs> and this is a typical restaurant and most of them don't have signs so you, and in the back of the back of the restaurant is someone's home and in the front is the restaurant and Laos is like some unwritten law it says you can only serve chicken soup for breakfast. <laughs> and so every morning for 31 days, I ate chicken soup for breakfast. And chicken soup is not filling. If you guys eat chicken soup when you're sick, not when you're about to bite four hours before lunch. So I actually figured out a way of saying, do you have anything other than chicken soup? And the guys would look at you in front of their big tub of chicken soup and just like do the sinister laugh and like scoop you out some more chicken soup. Yeah. And this is a typical road. So it's kind of like uh, unpaved asphalt. And it's not that bad going up, but going down, it's bad because you have all the bags with you so you're just bumping around your back feels like it's getting stepped on and the worst part is a lot of the roads you're going up like this so this comes through here and it actually probably goes out to like you know, 50 million feet that way and then comes back in and this was a 14 mile uphill just consecutive which is tiring to say the least. And I trained in Providence, Rhode Island, so I go to Brown. And there's no hills in Providence, Rhode Island. And I'd never cycled before, so all the cyclists here would, you know, do their thing and tell me that I should have known this. But I didn't know how much harder biking up was than just <laughs> black. So I learned my lesson really quickly. And by the end of a week, like I was walking like that. And 
I, my legs were just felt like rocks all the time, and I just get spasms, and I just wasn't used to it. And so this day, there were two, one uphill that was 17 miles, and one that was like 14. And it's basically just up and down, up and down, up and down. And in this case, I would stop in all, like a little village from time to time just to take a break. And when I did, it was, you know, I was a rock star. I was like President Clinton walking into like a Democratic convention and everyone just surrounds you and you, you know, what you can't see is there's like 360 degrees. Like kids, 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 probably like 100 or 200 kids. And in this case, they took me to their old school, which looks like that. And then they took me to a new school that's gotten built, which looks like that, which is really similar to the one that I helped build. So I didn't actually get to go see this the school that I helped build, but all the schools in Laos look the same, just as most of the big public schools in America look the same from that general, like the 1950s, 1960s generation. So that to that is what you get for $15,000, which is pretty phenomenal considering that's what, you know, twice as much as you pay for one kid in college in America. So your money goes pretty far. So that was awesome to visit that school on, on the third day. And then for lunch that day, I had the choice of pineapples or pineapples. And <laughs> there's a lot of different choices, but it's all pineapples. So then I ate about three pineapples that day, and I had to make it to the Chinese border to get back because of visa problems before my visa ran out. And they have these signs, which is awesome, because you have no idea how far you're going. And at this point, I biked around 70 miles that day. I think in kilometers now is the bike trip, so I'm trying to mentally convert it all the time. So there's like 10 kilometers left, so it's like 6 miles, and I'd eaten those three bananas, and I would just sit there and eat a bag of rice, and I was so hungry. And I finally got to the Chinese border, and this is a picture of me. The reason I look crazy is because at that point I thought I might go crazy. <laughs> I got to the border, and at all the other border crossings I'd ever been to, between, you know, I traveled like 20 countries, there's always a place to sleep at the border. And there is a place to sleep here at the border, you just have to be on the Chinese side. And Chinese immigration people aren't nice, to say the least. So I like tried to talk them into letting me just stay there for the night, and they said no. So at this point, I've been biking all day, I was really hungry, I need to find a place to sleep. And so I talked to the Lao immigration guy, and he's like, well, you can't sleep here, so go find another place to sleep. And it's not like traveling around downtown Little Rock looking for like a Holiday Inn. It's it's like being out in the boonies and looking for like a resort. It's just I was really tired, and eventually I found this place in literally the middle of nowhere. It said Tony's Guest House. I had no idea it was in English because I couldn't imagine someone else in English going there. So this is at night. That's when I first got there. And everyone there goes to bed when it gets dark out because there's no electricity. So you go with the sun. And I just knocked on the dude's window until it's long enough where he actually responds to me. So he looks at me and just hands me the key. And he's like, go away. <laughs> so he goes in and I have like, the whole place to myself, the whole place being like, two rooms. And I need somewhere to eat because I haven't eaten all day. And I had three pineapples, but I probably burned five to 8,000 calories that day. And the whole village is closed down. So I started just going and knocking on the neighbors, <laughs> looking for a place to eat. And this woman comes out. For some reason, she was up. They had a little kind of barbecue-ish thing. And they just go and kill a chicken for me, like right on spot, and throw the chicken on. And so I basically ate like a whole chicken. <laughs> and I ate it in probably five or six minutes. They kill another whole chicken. <laughs> and I, I sat there by the fire. And this was probably a 10 night. It was the best chicken I've ever had. <laughs> and I ate probably a chicken in three quarters. And the whole time, the whole family was just staring at me. <laughs> they, for a family there, they eat one chicken between the five of them once every two weeks. So when they were staring at me, it wasn't just because, you know, wow, he's eating a lot. It's like, wow, that's like if someone ordered 10 meals at a really nice restaurant here. So obviously I gave them money for doing this for me, but you know, meat for them is a luxury. So some days were kind of more fun and more physically exhausting, like this, and something weird or crazy would happen pretty much every day. And then some days were more mentally exhausting, and some of the stuff I saw. And next story, I'm gonna share one more story with you guys, is from 
I was going from the town of Badenbaum to the Thai border, which is about 60 miles. And the trip and all took, I think, seven hours. It's a different stuff. And once again, I was late on my visa, and you get some like, big trouble if you leave after your visa expires. So I had to race out of the country. And I raced out of the country on something that looks like this. It's just an old pickup truck. And they, tie, they tied my bike to the back, and you basically just hitchhike there. And you can't ride, like, it's impossible to ride your bike on this road because most of the potholes are like this, but the size of a car. It's basically just huge. It's, a, it's probably the worst road that I saw on my whole trip. And so we, I, they picked me up hitching at about 11 o'clock, and they tied me on. And there's only two people in the back. I was like, okay, I'm only 60 miles away. I'll get there by 2, and then I'll get across the border. <coughs> and not really. <laughs> so the first thing we did was we went and go pick this family up. You can only see three of them. There's about 11 of them. <laughs> and they all hop in the back. So now there's like 12 or 13 people in the back. And we're all hanging out. I'm like, you know, it's cozy and they're touching me, but it's not, you know, overwhelmingly packed. And then the whole time we're driving, you'll pick up more families and more families and more families. And I wish of all things I'd taken a picture of it. But by that time that we were all together, the whole thing, there was 36 people in the whole <laughs> And I'm not exaggerating, like I counted. I included the kids. Like, there were 10 inside the cab, and then more people on the back. And I'll tell you the reason why uh, in a second. But basically, you just do anything you can to get room. So you just go into a little ball like this, and then you just throw people on you. And so we got on that one pickup truck, and I thought I was going all the way to the border. But of course it wasn't, because nothing ever does what it's supposed to in Southeast Asia, which is kind of the fun, except if your visa's running out. <laughs> and so these were another family I picked up with this little girl. And like a sign of uh, respect or friendship, a lot of times they ask you to like hold your baby to symbolize that you know we're now friends. It's kind of, you know, you get used to it. So I held this little baby, and she was really cute. And this whole time I was with that family of 11 and 12, starting from about 11.30, and then finally we got to the first bus stop, which was about 20 miles away, which looks like this. And we hung out here, and this is, at this point I thought this truck was going all the way to the border, but it wasn't. So we all had to get out and switch to another pickup truck, and they all thought this was normal, of course, and I was going crazy, because I was like, looking at my watch. And then they tied my bike again, and I thought we'd go off. But you have to wait for it to get full again. So you have to wait for 30 more people to join you. <laughs> and during that hour and a half period, it starts pouring. Like you can't see your hand pouring. And like I was getting really hungry and I was getting pretty testy. And so the family decided to buy me some food. <laughs> they, I guess that always works. People who find food, they become in a better mood. So this is uh, like boiled eggs and this is a chicken on the stick. And, you have your options. So they bought me some food, and then finally, after an hour and a half, I took off to finally get to the border. And we get to the border after going on the road like this, flooded out from all the rain. And I was pretty miserable because I, you know, I slept like five hours the night before and just wanted to get there. Then you get there, and that's what the border town looks like. So about 80,000 people live like this, live in houses like that. And as we were going through the town, we start going through it. And it was, I've been to like a number of places in my life. There's the worst place I've ever been. Like most people don't live even under this. They just live, there's like raw open sewage everywhere. And we make a left down this road and start driving. And we drop the family of 13 off. And they start walking into the woods. And one of the guys that uh, is driving the truck, speaks English. And so I asked him, you know, like, why the hell did we just drop 13 people off to go work in the woods and walk in the woods? And he replied to me that they were going to walk to work at a sweatshop in Thailand and cross the border illegally because they make two fifty a day working in Thailand and $1.25 working in Cambodia. <coughs> and the little girl you saw in their little baby was one of them. So that's like a seven-year-old that's probably working 14 hours a day now in some sweatshop right across the border. 
And as you go through that town, there's all these signs that say don't sell kids, because hundreds of kids get sold each year from that time. I mean, modern day slavery is bigger in numbers than it ever was in history. And you know, there's just hundreds of kids running around like orphans from HIV. And it's just a place to sin while, it was, it was a pretty powerful experience in that you see so many things that are wrong in such a small area. And a lot of it, you know, is due to effects of globalizations like sweatshop or the ability to trade and sell people over commercial borders. And uh, the $5,000 I had extra from uh, raising money I actually went to put two girls on scholarship in this town so they don't get sold to slavery and they don't have to work in a sweatshop. But that day, of all the days on my trip, was probably the most powerful. And it was probably the day that I think about the most when I think I'm having a bad day now. Because that whole day I was, you know, pissing and moaning about not getting my visa by two. And these people live on their houses like that and go work 14 hours a day to work in a sweatshop. And so, oh, I saw stuff like this, and you mentioned getting tailed in Burma. I saw some other things in Burma that were pretty hard. But it, traveling by bike allowed me to see this stuff. Because if I'd gone to Cambodia and gone to some resort on the sea, you know, you see what you're supposed to see. And so I came back to the US, and it was in Cambodia that I decided to take a year off after seeing some of the stuff, because I wanted to tell other Americans, particularly kids, high school kids and college students, what I'd seen, and tell them that you know you can read a book or you can hear stories and you can do all these things, but unless you go and see it, I think that's the most powerful way to be motivated to do something about it. And I ended up arranging, when I got back to the U.S. in September, uh, a speaking tour with like 40 or 50 country, er, countries, high schools, and as I was going, I've spoken about 20 so far. You know, I keep advocating to kids, one, that you need to think globally and act globally, and two, you need to get out and travel, and that might motivate you to do so. And what I was realizing is you can go to like an Exeter or an Andover, and they can go and travel. But if you go to rural Arkansas and say, hey, go, go to Laos, they'll say, hey, I don't have $4,000 to go to Laos. So I thought, you know, it's a very <coughs> good point so I created a program called Transform Abroad, and what Transform Abroad is, is a, essentially a scholarship fund that pays for low and middle income American high school kids to go abroad and volunteer in a developing country for a summer. And I have a partner organization, Global Roots, that actually sends these kids on these trips, and they've been doing it for 20 years. And what high school kids do is they apply to me, and I'm looking for a kid that you know, would see something like I saw in Cambodia and be inspired to do something about it. And I want to give kids that might not be able to afford it the chance to go see in the world and become an effective global citizen. So I just actually launched this like a month ago, and now I'm trying to raise $25,000 to send six or seven kids this summer. And I'm accepting applicants from different high schools. But the reason I wanted to do this is, is because I want you know, these kids have the ability to travel, but I think everyone should go out and travel, and not travel like go to Mexico and sit on the beach, but travel like go to Nairobi and see that 95% of the people live in houses like I showed you. Because if you go and see this, it's a lot more powerful than reading about it or even watching a documentary. And so, you know, Transform Abroad is not, you know, it's centered for these kids that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it, and for high school kids, but I think all Americans particularly, since we're the global leaders, should be the most globally aware citizens. And unfortunately, Americans are some of the least well-traveled people among developed countries. And I think that's some of the reason now that the U.S. is partially alienated from the rest of the world is because there's this lack of understanding that comes with travel that I think some other cultures have. So I'm trying to get more kids in America, and not just kids, like, you know, people your age to go on a trip, and maybe if you've traveled before, take it one step further. So if you've gone to, you know, Europe before, this time go to Latin America, and just see something different. And this summer, I'm applying to go to Sierra Leone to work at a school that is all kids that were killed, or orphans of parents that were killed in the Civil War. And the reason I want to go there is because, unfortunately, 
in our world, there's almost every country, developing country, has some kind of conflict. And most of the world lives in a place where they're recovering in some way from a war. And the only way that I know for me to have an experience, to understand what they've been through, is to go live with them for three months. And although I'll never be able to know what it's like to have my mom killed in the Civil War, I'll be able to grasp what it's like for a billion people around the world that have seen violence, that have seen all this stuff happen. So I would urge you guys today you know, to think about something that you could do or a trip that you could go on and how you can use that trip and what you've seen to inspire you to do something about it. Because that's, I think, how travel can be used more effectively. If you go somewhere and then use that to do something about it. This is one of my favorite quotes. It says, a mind that is stretched by new experience can never go back to its dimensions. So if you go and experience this thing, like I can never now think of me as just an American or just you know some person that wants to go and live for themselves because I've seen so many people that have such tough lives. And if you go and have this experience, it's something that will always carry with you, hopefully trigger you to something, do something about it. So thank you for having me today, and I guess it's do we have, uh, if we have time, we can take a few questions. Do you have time? By a few, I mean zero. <laughs> did you meet any other travelers like you? I, I know you tried to stay away from other Western mm. travelers, but did you run into any that were in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. You run into some. Um, backpacking, unfortunately, is kind of a place where, like, if you, if you get a Lonely Planet guide to a country, everyone only goes to where Lonely Planet says. So I have, like, a, I read Lonely Planet wherever it says to go, I don't go. <laughs> and so you meet other people who have a similar attitude. Because once it becomes a backpacker hub, then you know drugs get there, and then all the Engl menus are in English, and then all these things happen. So I did meet some people that were traveling. You know, how I met two other people that were traveling by bike, uh, a Canadian couple and one guy from Finland. Um, but in general, I mean, there were times where I didn't speak English for a week or didn't see another foreigner for a while. Um, but day to day, I'd say probably. Three fourths of the places I stayed, I was the only foreigner in the town. Did you have times when you were really afraid of your safety? No, I was never scared. Um, violent crime in Southeast Asia is not the phenomenon it is in the West, but particularly in the U.S. A lot of it's due because when you have inequality, you have violence. In a, you know, it's very correlated. And in the, most of these villages, like when you go into a city, you kind of have to watch your back. In all these villages, it's very, you know, it's an egalitarian society. And there's no locks on doors. There's no concept of stealing something from someone that's your neighbor. Because most likely you, they make you dinner anyway if you work in their fields. So it's, and that's, I've learned a lot. And something that, that has taken, that I've taken away from there is a lot of things that, you know, we're the developed world and we're good and we're this. Um, but there's a lot of things that I like living there a lot more because there's not this, I need to go and buy stuff and I need to be scared of my safety because of what I have. And in all these villages, I, uh, I never felt, I mean, I would leave my bike in the middle of the village with everything I own to go play soccer and do whatever. And I, I wouldn't even worry about it. In the cities, a little because the cities are industrialized, and you have Beverly Hills sitting next to the houses I showed you. Do you have any mechanical difficulties on your bike? Or uh, <laughs> luckily, no really big ones, because I didn't even know how to fix a flat tire until uh, about like a thousand miles to the trip, <laughs> and it took me like an hour and a half because I was putting it on the wrong way. And then finally, I figured it out. Um, the worst thing that happened was sometimes on the really bad roads, I'd have to throw my bike into a back of a pickup truck, like I showed you. And one time, they closed the pickup bike door on my bike, which ripped open my front tire. And 
like you scratched up the whole. I don't know, I'm sure you guys know the word for it, but <laughs> something on the frame got all scratched up, and you had to get it redone because it rains every day, so it would rust and then be a problem. So I just had one of those sticky things you put inside the tire. I'm sure you guys have a cool name for them. And, uh, <laughs> put that on, and then when I got back to Bangkok. Bangkok's like, they have western bike stores, so I bought a new tire there. And I went around Nam Pen for like two hours, just looking for painting shops, because none of them have signs, but all the, all the places uh, that are one industry are in one place. So you'll have 40 places in a row that sell furniture. And then I found like the painting street, which is like 30 <laughs> people in a row. And I just had some guy repaint my bike for like $4. So that was the worst thing that happened. There were some other times I thought really, really bad stuff happened, and then I just had to like click one button and it worked. <laughs> but there were at least three times that I thought my whole trip was going to end, and it was because I had bike in the wrong gear or something. Did you communicate with anyone with your family during this time? Yeah, there. Like as I said before about back backpackers, mm -hmm. wherever there's backpackers, there's certain things come in the probably the second one's email. Mm -hmm. So in Nam Pen in the capital of Cambodia, there's probably a thousand email places. And there's a lot more email places than you would think. But really if you look through any lonely planet in the world and it says go there, there's an internet cafe there. Because people are I understand the point of people that go and sit on the computer the whole time when they travel, but <laughs> a lot of people end up doing that. No. You know, go downtown and go to some place that didn't have an English menu, and then come back and type it up to their friend for like two hours about it. Uh, so, I would, I actually had a journal on the website I made, Cycle for Schools, which was a lot better because you learn traveling that you hate sitting in front of the computer, and you learn that everyone emails you and asks you the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to say like, hey, blah blah blah, and type the same thing. So having a journal, like when I go on my next big trip, I'm just going to have a journal because then everyone can read it, and then you don't have to answer the same email 500 times. What sort of resonance have you felt when you've told your stories to people your own age back here in the United States, to high school students? Are you getting a positive Yeah, kind of thing? I think that showing them, actually, them actually seeing pictures is really effective, especially for a younger age. Because when kids that are in an auditorium that probably cost $2 million look at a picture that's a shack and realize that that's where they would go to school if they lived there, they're pretty, yeah, it's everyone's pretty competitive. All you get, I could go for five minutes. I've, I've done presentations that are five minutes and kids get the idea. Um, how well that impact is turning into actual projects is hard for me to judge. Because I don't know if I inspired some kids to go do something that you wouldn't know, um, or to get some kid to travel. But hopefully, I have. And a lot of these, a lot of schools have service projects, but kids, a lot of kids don't just have to get to college. Or number two, they're just there, and people have never understood why they would do a service project. So I think hopefully it's it's gotten kids interested in actually getting engaged in something that their school is already doing. In a lot of cases. Talk a little bit about how you, how you worked with Room to Read and how the, the school was actually built. Yeah, so I basically emailed Room to Read, and they have what's really cool about them in terms of how they measure results is they have a here's what we do if you want to donate it, here's how much it costs. So they basically told me flat out, you raised $15,500 and we'll build you a school in Laos. And you don't get to choose your village or anything, it's kind of like each, like last year they built 20 schools in Laos. So whenever I got my money in, like if I got it in fifth out of the 20 donors, then it would go to the fifth school that they were building that year. And I mean, personally, I didn't have my heart, heart set on any village. So it went to a random village. And then in terms of actually building the school, I had a chance, uh, just because of time that I didn't show you, but I had a chance to visit a place with the Room Treat staff in Laos. So Room Treat's an American-based NGO, and most of the people that work in America are American, but all the people that work in Vietnam and Laos and India are from that country, which is effective because so you don't have all this cross-cultural stuff, and you'd spend two-thirds of your time figuring out what you're trying to say. So I had a chance to go with the Laos staff in, in Laos to a school that they built, 
But in terms of me actually helping build the school, I give the money to Room to Read, and then they work with the local government ministry and the village themselves. And basically what the, the money goes for is supplies, so that they can build a school that's not bamboo, they can build a school that's made out of brick and have a foundation so they don't have to rebuild it every year, and it doesn't have to look like that. Um, so in terms of me actually, like I've never seen the school that I sponsored, um, but I'm hoping it will go back one day. Did they send you pictures? Yeah, they sent me the pictures uh, maybe two weeks ago. So, because I got the money in May, so they started building it right in June. It takes six months approximately, like almost on the dot. So they sent me pictures, which is pretty cool. So, are you a cyclist now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or anti-cyclist? No, no, I'm a, I'm a cyclist. I just still don't know anything about bikes. <laughs> No, no, I, I actually, like, I really enjoy cycling, it's just, it's not like running, where all you have to do is run, it's like, you have to bike and then take care of your bike. So, no, I like biking, I think I'm going to bike around the world and do a different project, so I really like biking, um, it's just, I wish I could bike now, it's just traveling, it's hard to bike a lot, and Providence or that one is a bad place to bike, just in case you guys are planning on doing it. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the language, how, how you picked it up? Did you like that? Uh, well, usually like when I go to a country, like immediately the first day, I'll, I'll write down 20 words or phrases that I need to know, and then find, and in most border towns, someone speaks English, because it's a border town, so other people cross. So then you go to someone that speaks English, and then you figure out how to say those things. Then you just spend the night and memorize them. So like in my case, I would learn food, water, how far, place to sleep, <coughs> stuff like that, uh, really just basics, and then point a lot, <laughs> and actually more people speak English than you think um, in the towns and cities, because English there is kind of like a college degree here, if you don't speak English, just as if you don't have a college degree in the U.S., there's a lot of things you just can't do. So if you want to work for an international NGO and you don't speak English, you can't apply. So people will come up to you, who's the... Wait, someone here just biked through Southeast Asia. Yes. So I was, what's your name again? Ken. <coughs> Excuse me, Ken Gould. Okay, thanks. Sorry. So Ken, we were talking about, and he said the same thing happened to him, where people will come up to you and approach you and say, hey, can I practice English with you? So basically, to meet people, all you have to do is sit down in like a busy park, and people will come up to you and speak. Um, but pointing goes way, way, way farther than you would think. In fact, the, the most important word that we found in traveling in, in any foreign country, particularly third world countries, is thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's that's a problem. I mean, I could, of all the words that I remember still from all the countries I've been to, that's, I can say, I can still remember thank you in Laos, Cambodian, and Burmese. Yeah. Saying even like little, little things like hello in their language, even if you don't get past that. Uh, means a lot. Or if you greet them, like if you try and hug a woman in Cambodia, it's, you, you don't. <laughs> so, like if you are in the proper way to greet them, you know, it's like if I went up to you and you tried to shake my hand and I stand like this, even though you know it's not part of my culture, you're still kind of offended just at a root level. So, just having that little stuff makes a really big difference. And not to bang on Americans, but of all the nationalities that don't make that effort, probably Americans in, are one of the top accusers. Of, so I make a special effort to do so. You said that you were going to bike around the world and you do another project. Do you already have in mind what you want to do? Yeah, well, I was thinking, so I've gone to all these high schools and they've all been pretty interested. And what I was thinking is biking around the world and creating another website and biking for maybe 18 months, and getting each of the high schools that I went to, or different high schools that would be interested, to sponsor one school. So you have like Little Rock Central High School sponsors Van May Primary School. So they raise 15,500, or different organizations, however much. And then that money goes to there. And then on my trip, I would take video, uh, other techie things, camera, and like a satellite uplink laptop, 
So I'd go and visit, I'd bike from all the schools that got built and sponsored, so I'd get to satellite back what it's like, you know, what these kids are actually raising money for. So, I mean, the cheer up would be for three reasons, actually. One is for um, letting folks on get movie for environmental awareness, because if I bike around the world, it's a lot healthier than flying around the world. Number two would be to actually build more schools. But I think the third and most important thing would be to get these kids excited about raising money and excited about thinking more globally. And and hopefully, you know, it would spread and there would be more press so that, I mean, there's 120 million kids in the world now that are primary school age that don't go to school. So that's like if you filled up an NFL stadium 2,000 times of all the kids that should go to school that don't. So, I mean, if you can be a right-wing crazy guy or a left-wing crazy guy, like no one disagrees that every kid should be able to go to school. I think it's just getting more people, particularly in North America, to recognize that statistic. And that's what the chair would, I would hope would do. That goal also aligns with the millennial goal of universal primary yeah, education. Yeah, that's one of the six ones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, by 2015. Let me, uh, let me say, um, when, uh, when the email came that, uh, that, that Patrick was traveling around um, speaking at schools, when I saw that, I, uh, I did say to, that, that we wanted him here. And I will tell you that you have exceeded my highest expectations on this. This was a fabulous program. And I also told him as we were visiting earlier that because he was telling about all the work he was doing and traveling around, and I, I told him that he needed to take it, at least, Dr. Bruce, a year, a year and a half off mm -hmm. uh, and come to Clinton School. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, before you leave, uh, Tom Bruce, Gary Wheeler, Faye, Dustin, John DePippa, and others are going to talk to you a little bit, Patrick. But, <laughs> you know, this is public service mm -hmm. at its finest, and we owe him a tremendous thanks. And, You've done great work.